Hunger and poverty, to me, are the great enemies of mankind. Having lived through the economic depression of the early 30s, I know some of this from personal experience, never to the same extent that I've seen in many third world countries, such as during the middle 60s, the hunger and famine of India and Pakistan, uh, which left a dreadful impression on me that uh, I carry with me today in many other parts of the world. The whole world has been shocked by recent famines, but outrage has often given way to feelings of hopelessness about the enormity of the problem. Africa is the hungriest continent, and nearly every statistic shows that the situation is getting worse. Yet all the technology is available for a revolutionary change in African agriculture, which can actually prevent the dreadful toll of famine. How this transformation can happen is shown by the work in Ghana of an international development initiative, the Sasekawa Global 2000 Agricultural Project. It is an important model for the future of how Africa can feed itself. The commitment of the Sasakawa Global 2000 project is to the small subsistence farmers of Ghana and to the conviction that putting the results of agricultural research into the hands of these farmers can revolutionize food production in Africa. Al Hassan Youssef leaves for work with his sons from Busa, a small village near Wa in Upper West Ghana. This community lives on what they can grow on their small plots not far south of the Sahara Desert. Staying alive has been a constant struggle against all the uncertainties of Ghanaian agriculture, like drought and poor soils. Until recently, life for their community was the same as it had been for generations. Without access to modern technology, they have developed sophisticated survival skills in a harsh environment. But now things are changing for their community, and they are the pioneers of this change. Norman Borlog in Adoye, a village in central Ghana. He has spent a lifetime using new technology to combat food shortages. And in 1970, he won the Nobel Peace Prize for introducing high-yielding wheat varieties to small-scale farmers. He inspired a process which came to be known as the Green Revolution, which has dramatically increased agricultural yields in many other parts of the world. So why not Africa? This was a question which struck Ryochi Sasekawa, a man who had become well known for supporting third world development through the Japanese shipbuilding industry foundation, and who remembers that 50 years ago, Japan also had two little food. Deeply disturbed by the images of famine in Ethiopia and Sudan, he was among the first to fly in food aid to those countries in late 1984. But he wanted to treat the causes of food shortage in African countries rather than just reacting to its consequences. So he got his office to contact Norman Borlaug to see what could be done. His public relations man, he said, Mr. Sasakawa becomes very upset every afternoon when he turns on his television set for the late world news. And he sees all of this hunger and misery in Ethiopia and in southern Sudan. And he wants to know why something isn't being done about it, like was done in Pakistan and in India in the uh, middle 1960s, when everyone said India and Pakistan are hopeless causes. And, you, and your group of scientists moved in and uh, changed this situation dramatically. Devastated by the famines of the 60s, India and Pakistan had got together with scientists like Norman Borlaug to bring modern methods into agriculture. In a period of just 20 years, they had more than quadrupled production. 
Could this experience transfer to Africa? This crucial question was discussed at an international conference in Geneva in 1985, and Norman Borlaug said yes, it could. So Ryochi Sasakawa pledged funds for an initial pilot project. But they needed also the political support of the African countries, and ex-president Jimmy Carter offered his help. Well respected in Africa, his report towards Global 2000 had highlighted food deficits as a key issue. Our organization has nothing to do with any governments. Uh, it's a private group of people. Our hope is to alleviate the starvation in Africa. And we've chosen three or four nations to visit with the hope of uh, improving the uh, production of food grain, grains, not on the large corporate farms, not on the big uh, cooperative farms, but on, among the small farm families. Ghana still suffers from many of the symptoms of underdevelopment. Bad roads, poor communications, and inadequate health care. To make things worse, the population is growing by over 3% each year, meaning it will double in the next 20 years. Already, Ghana has an overall food deficit and relies on imported food. This situation is of great concern to Ghana's Secretary for Agriculture, Steve Kovimpo. Agriculture is the backbone of the economy. Majority of Ghanaians live on agricultural activity in one way or the other. Since time of independence, Ghana had lived substantially on agriculture. Major part of the foreign exchange earning was derived from cocoa. We've launched an economic recovery program and having assessed all the resources that we have at our disposal, we believe that it is in the agricultural sector that the economy recovery program will make an impact. A group of women farmers in Busa. They formed a collective to try the new methods. And Louisa Diane is their extension officer with the job of assisting them in taking up the new technologies. A recent memory has brought into sharp focus why they are so anxious to learn. Well, in 1983, there was a general shortage of food. And because of that, we were really very hungry. It affected them in their health. We cannot really say that there was a family that wasn't affected. Well, we could say that uh, there was starvation, I would say, severe starvation on the land, unprecedented in, in, in our history, uh, to the point that we had actually to appeal uh, to the international community uh, for some food aid. As a result of that, there was uh, an awakening of all Ghanaians, not only uh, uh, people in government, but all Ghanaians of all walks of life, uh, to take agriculture uh, perhaps more seriously than we hitherto as a nation uh, had uh, taken agriculture. And then, One person who has taken up the challenge that. of agricultural development with great okay, energy let's see what is, is Imoru Seydou. Initially, the project had decided not to go as far north as Upper West Ghana. But as Deputy Secretary for Agriculture oh, in the Upper meter. West, he persuaded yeah. them differently. And then? This store of sorghum then, uh, is being built up as a buffer against bad years from local production, so they need not rely on food aid. Food aid actually is a disincentive to uh, local production, lo the local farming community. With our experiences uh, with the Sasakawa Global 2000 in this region, I'm convinced that we have the potential to feed ourselves and we don't need food aid. What we need is the appropriate technology which would enable us to exploit our own potential, which we know exists. So in most but areas, how to introduce the improved grow, methods uh, when so many previous projects had yes, made little impact? Uh, the backing of the Ghana government was crucial for the strategy. They would provide the organization, and Norman Borlaug chose a high-quality team to be the catalyst for the new technologies. First was the country director, Dr. Eugenio Martinez. Dr. Martinez is a low-key, very effective leader. But then how about the Brona Half Warashanti? He brings together a warm family under his quiet leadership. Well, I think I'd like to be a little more cautious this year. Our philosophy was to try to improve whatever the farmers have. So we dedicate most of the effort initially to work together with the farmers, to show them and find out how much uh, was possible to increase the production, the productivity of the, their farms. Matthias Akpasoy is the foremost maize breeder in Ghana. The person who provides this spark here in Ghana 
is Dr. M. K. Akbasoy. From Senegal, they chose Dr. Marcel Galiba. And the willingness of extension people. And from South Korea, Dr. Chong Wun Hong. There is no doubt we can expand, you know, something like uh, even 100,000. Dr. Hong, first of all, is a very talented agronomist. He knows soils. He knows how to restore fertility to infertile, worn out soils. He is what I call an integrator. He can put the pieces together. But more important than any other is his enthusiasm. Enthusiasm and a positive outlook is very important when you are trying to transform a traditional society. We are planting the crop into the soil. The reason why we are doing that is that soil will supply the plant nutrient to the crops. Now, but in many places, soils are not fertile enough. Much of the countryside in Ghana looks green, particularly now in the rainy season. But the apparent fertility is an illusion, depending as it does on a complex and fragile system of trees and plants which do not produce food. In reality, the soil is very infertile, and producing crops is a constant struggle against barren land. So some sort of fertilizer is essential. You can think of organic matter or chemical fertilizer. Then many people are arguing that in the tropics, farmers are so poor, the use of chemical fertilizer may not be appropriate. But use of organic matter is also inappropriate in this circumstance because the, there is no organic matter. Usually the organic manure is coming from animal droppings. Here, they do not have enough food to feed the human beings. How can they feed the animals? Even if organic manure were available, to provide as much nitrogen as a single bag of fertilizer like this, you would need about 30 bags of animal manure. For this maize farmer, one 50 kilogram bag of fertilizer is quite enough to carry. So for many reasons, chemical fertilizer is the only feasible solution. <laughs> What have been the underlying reasons for the project's success? One of the first principles was to concentrate on the smaller farmers like these in the maize growing area of Domango. The main difference with other projects in the past has been that uh, ours is very simple. We, we intend to do it simple so the farmers and everybody will understand the principle of it. Another key factor was the introduction of new high yielding seed varieties with the ability to maximize the benefit of fertilizer application. These varieties have been bred to meet local conditions by the Crops Research Institute in Kumasi. Another principle is that the technology should be tested out on the farmer's own fields on a large enough scale to realize appreciable economic benefits. They ask farmers to divide their fields into two halves and to use traditional methods on one half and the new methods on the other. These two plots were planted with the same seed just one day apart. They call these plots production test plots, or PTPs. Azuma Kunda has worked her farm as a PTP for the first time this year. She, used, she planted all on the same, on just a day difference. Now for the PPT, she could be able to afford fertilizer to apply on the PPT. But she never had fertilizer on her, or in, uh, her, her own field. That's why there has been some differences. This astonishing yield response to fertilizer is one of the reasons for the project's success. Azuma can expect to get three or four times as much yield on her PTP than on her traditional plot, so she can expect significant profits after harvest. It's a far cry from the small test plots, just a few meters square, with which most scientists try to convince farmers to change their methods. Global 2000 method really has proved to us to be better yield wise as against uh, the traditional one. From a test or experiment we've uh, carried out as uh, farmers, we realized that uh, the traditional method really does not give a very good uh, result as against uh, the Global 2000. The new methods mean that farmers get on average two and a half times the yield in maize and three and a half in sorghum. 
Even after discounting the costs of the fertilizer and other inputs, they double their profits in maize and triple their profits in sorghum. With these sort of improvements, it's not surprising that actor Zachariah is so enthusiastic, along with other project pioneers like Al Hassan Youssef, Jayan Bana, and Al Hassan Samsadin. In Ghana, they started with a small number of test plots in 1986, 20 in the northern region and 20 in Upper West. Just 40 plots in the whole of Ghana. In 1987, they had expanded to 1,600. And by 1988, there were nearly 20,000. For 1989, tens of thousands of farmers applied to take part. It's becoming hard to cope with the demand. But how can a team of just four scientists create this sort of change on this sort of scale? The answer is that they can't. They have been the catalyst for change. The people who have created the change are the farmers themselves and Ghana's extension service through the contribution of extension officers like Osman Abdullah. Farmers such as Azuma Kunda are in constant need of technical advice and Ghana's Department of Extension is designed to introduce new ideas and new technologies at the grassroots level. Their success explains why the ideas have been taken up with such amazing speed. Farmers need to become more knowledgeable and more self-reliant. And this is underlined by another of the project's basic principles. They give nothing away for free. Well, they don't get physical cash to pay to buy the fertilizer. But this group of 2000 helps me by supplying me the fertilizer. And then when I finish the work at the end of the year, then I pay. When I came here for the first time, and we met, you know, one chief, and he asked us, what are you going to bring to us? Are you going to bring to us some car, some fertilizer, or a tractor? Well, it was a very difficult question for us to answer promptly, but somehow I volunteered and answered. We are not going to bring anything free. No fertilizer, no car, no tractor. Then he said, then what are you going to give us? And we said, I said, we are going to bring our heart and our experience. I have a 22 years experience. That experience and my heart I'm going to bring to here and to work with you. Not help you simply, but to help you, help yourself. Initially, the project underwrote all the loans of fertilizer and improved seeds themselves, but their main aim was to stimulate a self-sustaining change. So together with the Department of Extension, they soon turned to other sources of credit. But would the banks lend to poor farmers? We poor farmers cannot get I mean, credits in the banks, simply because when you go to the bank for money, in fact, these officers will not look you because you have nothing with you. Only this money has been given to the richest farmers because they are well to do. But is Saka Ninsinwala right? Awutu Kati is the manager of the local branch of the cooperative bank. Bankers very rarely have enough confidence to lend to peasant farmers, and it's not often that they go out into the fields to visit them. But it's been one of Imoru Sedu's achievements to persuade the more progressive bankers to see for themselves what's happening. First, with the inception of the program, we've taken bankers to the field to see uh, what is on the field. I think that's what the bankers need mostly, to be assured that whatever happens, they'll be able to recover where they advance to the farmer as a loan. The first time you uh, started the job, did you get any assistance from anybody? Or yes. you started by yourself? No. From these extension officers. The extension officers. Yeah, from, they, uh, they come from what to help me. Uh, it is the duty of the extensionists and for that matter global 2000 to educate the farmer to know that it is the banks that are sponsoring them and not global 2000 as such. Because some of them have the impression that global 2000 is having a lump of money where we can chip it off and give it to the farmer and do anything to like with it. No, we don't want to do that. We want to educate the farmer to know that they owe the banks 
and that is where they can get their credit facilities. The bankers still don't lend directly to the poorer farmers, so indirectly they financed most of the 7,000 farmers who participated in Upper West in 1988, an important advance, since farming in these difficult environments is always a risk. Every fortnight, the extension officers in Upper West meet to share problems and to get advice from the Ministry of Agriculture's technical advisors. May not affect it very much. Yield may reduce, but not as much. So now I don't know, actually know what agriculture has been described as a battle, use. a battle we against such things as uh, low rainfall and poor soil. The nitrogen is the limiting factor because it is only nitrogen that makes the plant look green. So Fertilizer, pests, diseases, new varieties, a whole range of important technical issues. Currently, the technical officers now, want to encourage thinning and transplanting uh, of sorghum, and Louise is here to get case, advice for her women farmers. Uh, the fertilizer or whatever we put to the soil is meant for only one plant. And there is a growing hunger for knowledge and information plant, about the new production 10, methods. 20, Louisa Diang has become part of the community rather than an outsider. That's why the group have taken to the new methods with such enthusiasm. There's just a lot of fallacy about the ultra-conservative, the resistance of change of the traditional farmer. He may be illiterate, but he can figure whether the new technology has the possibility to bring he and his family a slightly better income. I long ago decided that we had to move these results onto the farm as soon as there was available the pieces to put together to make a sizable change in yield and production. This was done in Mexico when there was no extension service. We in research did it, and it became a part of our philosophy. And uh, I am very impatient with those who think that uh, a good piece of research automatically produced more food. We need to learn new things all the time. But at the same time, I think, in case of agricultural science, doing research alone should not be meaningful. I know there are many scientists who want to remain in the laboratory and continue the research. But I think there should be some people who really is interested in bringing the message, sleeping in the library to the farmer's very land. The first step for Ghana's successful technology evolution has been the introduction of chemical fertilizer, which depends for its manufacture on non-renewable petroleum products. In the long term, what will guarantee that the system is sustainable in the environmental sense? I object to some of the ideas that I constantly hear being proposed by certain narrow-minded individuals in the affluent nations that in essence say, don't upset status quo in the third world countries. Don't introduce modern technology into agriculture because it's not sustainable while they themselves are privileged to be utilizing vast quantities of non-renewable -renew resources for their own and their own society's personal uh, benefits. As soon as you have something that has the potential to produce more food and that it can be done with reasonable levels of risk, put it into operation on farms, never waiting for the perfect. And with the population monster relentlessly pushing forward, 85 million more people every year on a worldwide basis. That means approximately 164 more people every minute. There is no time for status quo. And for the future, when Ghana get, uh, is investing in the education home. of its children. It's the children farm. who will suffer if today's policies are wrong. And it's Make the sure children who will take the next generation of technology into the fields. It's up to the politicians to create a climate in which agriculture can thrive. This is a new experience for me here in south of the Sahara. But I see the same fire now beginning to burn. I call this setting the grass roots on fire. And it's heating up for the political decision makers and uh, God willing, and also the will of the political leaders, the opportunities exist here in the next two or three years for a major 
breakthrough in production that can become a model for African countries south of the Sahara. I personally cannot live comfortably uh, in the midst of abject poverty and hunger and human misery. If I have, if I have the possibilities of even in a modest way, with the help of my many scientific colleagues, of doing something about improving the lot of these many young children for their generation. Thank you.